Thanks everybody for coming. Um, happy SIGGRAPH. My name is Luis Skrull and I'm a tech artist at SideFX and I'm going to give you guys some updates on the game development tool set and some of the stuff that we're building um, around game dev and, and a little bit more. Um, how many of you are familiar with the game dev tool set? Awesome. Cool. Um, so for those that are not here and are not familiar with it, um, the primer is basically it's a bunch of tools. There's a, a, over 150 of them at this point uh, that are developed for helping learning the, the help with the learning curve of Houdini and basically help you get started with Houdini, uh, do kind of production focused examples and basically get data out of Houdini or do common operations that, like Aria was saying, we usually we go talk to a customer and they'll be like, hey, I did this really cool thing. This should just be built into Houdini. And usually we'll take it, look through it, and then kind of modify it a little bit and bring it in. Uh, and then the, there's a, th a team of three of us. So it's myself, uh, Mike Linden does a lot of the effects and general work. And then Paul, I'm Bruce Houston, who also does a lot of the work. Um, so I am representing their work and it's a pleasure working with them, uh, but it is a, it's a team effort. So just so you guys are aware, again, that development process is something I wanted to touch on. So it all starts with the customer interaction. So here at SIGGRAPH, I'm getting a ton of ideas from just running into people and having meetings. Um, that goes into a prototype and then that prototype goes back to the customer. They give me feedback. We do a first release that gets back to the customer. We'll start fixing it. We'll put it out in the wild and it's really a collaborative um, workflow. So we do daily builds. Yeah, so the, the, the cool thing is that it's a very open kind of agile development process to where we're working with the customers, getting feedback, putting it out to the wild for everybody. Some of it um, we label as a beta to where it's just it's, it's pretty raw. Some of it gets hardened by the community. So a lot of these tools are basically being used in production right now and with multiple ship titles behind them. Um, so it is, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome steady um, set of tools. So like I said, uh, we've actually been gathering some numbers. So there's over 150 tools, over 6,000 users at this point, 100,000 nodes dropped. Um, here's some stats on the countries. So it is kind of worldwide. And this is around one year of collection. So we started collecting data August of last year. Um, so the funny thing is that it's, it's I'll, I'll touch into this later. So it is a game development tool set, but clearly it's not just for game dev. So clearly film and advertising and industrial studios are using it. Um, so we'll touch that in a little bit later, but it's, it's widely adopted. It's getting rigorous testing. Um, it's going, uh, we're really proud of it. So in this tool updates, I want to talk a little bit about our GDC projects and some of the things that came out of it. And then I have some cool new announcements to share um, that we're really excited for. So if you haven't seen that GDC, um, we did two projects, one based in Unity, one based in Unreal. They were to kind of show the breadth of the power of Houdini to where the Unity one was a mobile game that actually ran on my phone. And uh, the thought there was to take a Photoshop file and then convert that to a fully playable level. Um, we have the whole workflows up online. And then our Unreal level, you might have seen a lot of this image um, all around SIGGRAPH. They're going to be up in real time live. Uh, it was a collaboration with Quixel. Um, we've done a few uh, videos on it already, so check it out. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, we're really proud of it, part of Rebirth. Um, and we work really closely with Quixel on that one. Uh, the cool thing about having these projects is that it forces us to kind of do a mini production cycle. Um, so we do, after GDC is done, we'll kind of harvest the projects for new tools. And from the Unity project, we actually got eight different tools. Um, you can see here, and there's a five different tools from the Quixel project. So say like the, the sci-fi panel generator was used to generate the mega structure on Rebirth, and that's the same HTA that we use there. Now everybody can use and play with it and ideally evolve it. So the, the cool thing is that we, we got feedback from Quixel on it, but now it's there for everybody. And if anyone has feedback, we'll, we'll take it and uh, build it. And so this is the second year that we've done a, a kind of full on uh, GDC project. And now a little pattern is starting to emerge for us on the year to where it kind of starts up at GDC. And then we'll kind of do a harvesting process in May, April. We'll do some customer visits and some trips in uh, May to July. We'll have SIGGRAPH as the other big event of the year. And then at the moment we're back, we're going to start back into project development mode. So if you guys have ideas and things like these are kind of general themes that I'm trying to solve. We have some ideas of what we want to do for our next GDC, but now you can kind of expect some of the development to kind of culminate and work on this cycle. We found that it works pretty well for us to where we have time to kind of go heads down and really build something that is kind of production ready and to be able to kind of come back up and, and talk to everybody and, and do customer visits. Um, so some of the recent work, 
that might have kind of slipped through the cracks. So this one is a kind of cool tool that we built for the Unity project. It's, uh, we call it Curve Branches, and it's essentially a fake little L system. So we needed to build the little bushes in, uh, for the demo, and L systems are too hard for my brain. So I, <laughs> there you go, yeah. Um, so I wanted something that was a little more intuitive. So you can basically make a curve and kind of grow it and, uh, and do different things to it. But the cool thing is that this is kind of recursive. So if I make one kind of set of curves that you can make your base of your flower, uh, but then you can do another node that basically chains on that and that makes the kind of recursive. And then you can kind of keep chaining these together to as many levels of recursions as you want. Um, in this case, three is generally enough. Here you can see um, you can get pretty deep and there's like all sorts of variations and you can have controls on how you want those to work. You can then mesh those and kind of get them. Uh, but it's one of those, it's a really cool tool that I feel kind of slipped through the cracks to where we didn't really talk about. Um, and just that idea of kind of building recursion with nodes themselves um, was kind of neat. Another tool that wasn't necessarily done for the Rebirth project, but was done immediately after for Quixel is this cable generator. And the idea here is you draw a zigzag line and everybody has built cable generators, so we felt like we just needed to build one. Um, so with the little zigzag of the curves, you can kind of control the belly of the cable drop. Um, instead of relying on a fully simulated version, um, you can do something that's a little more procedural. And then because you drew it in 2D, it doesn't mean that you have to be in 2D, you can always go back to your original curve and start pulling it apart. Um, and like I said, because of that zigzag control, it's a very nice artist-friendly way instead of having to control slack and some more kind of physical uh, means, you can um, really easily tune it. And we do have a vellum solver in there if you do want to de detangle it, so it's kind of built in. Um, so I'm going to do that in a little bit, and then there's like a lot of controls. Um, yeah, so we can do a, a quick little detangle just to get something to look a little bit better. Um, this was actually built for and used by Victor. Omen, um, and this is a little dark, but the cabling here on the scene that he posted on his art station uh, was the use case for this tool. And again, I, I, this is a, a clear example of having a customer needing something, coming to us, we build it, have a tight little loop with them, and then put it out to the wild, and now we have a kind of wider loop to where we're talking to multiple customers. And a lot of the times people just use the tools to kind of start with it. So they'll say, I need a cable generator. That's not what I want. I want something different, but there's some cool ideas there. So I'm gonna take that as my starting point instead of starting from a, a blank slate. Another tool that I think we've talked about a little bit, but it's too cool to not mention. Um, it's the Alice Vision integration. So uh, we've had a reality capture integration for a little bit, which is a photogrammetry software. But again, a lot of the film clients that are based on Linux couldn't use it because reality capture doesn't have a Linux integration. Um, so Alice Vision does, um, and we have a full pipeline. So you just give it a bunch of photos, and um, it will calculate the models for you. You can also break out the individual photogrammetry steps and as the different nodes, or you can kind of do it this way where you just have a single node. And I'll see if I can skip through, because Paul talks a little bit. And yeah, so basically the thought is that from within Houdini, you can um, generate the the full photogrammetry model and get it back out. Uh, and this runs on Linux, uh, which is, it's awesome. Um, another tool that Paul did, and he did a webcast on this on uh, LA Hug, is our new baker. So we've had, I think three bakers at this point. So we had the original games baker, then we wrapped that up into a SOP, into uh, a simple baker. But both of those were inherently mantra bakes. Um, which had a lot of kind of initial startup cost of um, dealing with it. So we actually wrote a new one uh, called the Maps Baker, which is in COPS, and it can bake a 4K map in nine seconds. So it's extremely fast, and it matches parity um, pretty close to one-to-one -to -one with Mantra. So we kind of used it to calibrate it. So we bake curvature, normal maps, um, all of the maps you would expect, uh, and it's, it's super, super fast. So please use it and let us know if you have issues, but do note to transition to this one if you guys are using the Simple Baker or the other ones, just because this one is a lot faster and it's the one that we want to maintain. So in this one, we're actually doing all the math ourselves, so all of the kind of ray tracing into the other mesh and sampling the geometry and baking it out to the texture. So we have full control. So even if you want a different algorithm to doing the bakes, uh, we have full control of that now because we're not going through a renderer. 
Another one which is kind of one of those embarrassing, this should have been in Houdini all along. Um, this is a double punch in the, this demo because we have a spiral sop. That is something that we should have had. Um, so now we have a spiral sop that you can build spirals and curves. And we have a path deformer. Uh, so if you want to sweep things along a curve and just deform those, uh, we have that as well. So here I'm just doing some expressions to kind of make sure my box is placed properly. And then there's the path to form SOP that does what you expect. So it's kind of a super simple, basic setup, but another one that everybody needs it. Uh, it's not in there by default. We're hoping that by having it in the game dev tools, that will eventually make itself um, into it. Um, we've had a couple of tools that kind of made that graduation process where they started in game dev and are now in proper Houdini. Uh, but even if it doesn't, uh, it's there for you guys to play with. Another one that is a pretty big one is the building generator. So this continues our effort into the kind of city building environment workflows. Um, it is a modular set to where it worked instead of doing the traditional just extrusion and procedural, all procedural geometry, it actually works with modules, which is more of a traditional game pipe load want, uh, which allows you to do more custom stuff. Uh, it can spit out a full static mesh geometry or just ge raw geo or it can spit out the cloud data for you. So you can basically get the instances of all of the points and then um, bring that into a game engine. Um, the reason I showed this one is that actually we have really solid documentation for it uh, online, which was done by Matt Estella, who gave an awesome presentation earlier and is going to give another one. So we actually hired Matt to do a lot of our documentation for the game dev tools. Um, so he does CG Wiki. If you guys haven't seen it, it's the, one of the best resources for uh, Houdini learning. And he does his signature GIFs on our documentation too, which is, it's, uh, we're really excited to have. Uh, so some, just to talk a little bit about how the game team kind of interacts with R&D proper. Uh, we have been working closely with them for a while. So there has been a bunch of contributions that we've done to Houdini proper, even though it's kind of detached from the game dev tool set. Uh, so the hair cards for Houdini 16.5 were part of the game dev tool tool chef that just went straight into Houdini and they actually bypassed the game dev pipeline entirely. The material, and that was false. Uh, the material fracture might work closely with R&D team to get that pipeline going. And then for 17.5, I've added a few things where I work closely with uh, R&D on it. So I'll go through them. Uh, the one that also might have slipped through the cracks is we have now viewport parity with a lot of the major players in the industry. So in the top left, you can see it's Houdini's viewport on the high quality mode. Then we have the same asset in Unreal, Marmoset, and Substance Painter. So that was just something that we just needed to uh, do. And now we have kind of table stakes. Everything looks the same. You can assume that your asset is going to look the same in your game engine as it is. It's going to work inside of Houdini. Um, we did calibrate it to Mantra. Um, so these are two shots. One is rendered from Mantra, and the other one is a flipbook from the viewport. And uh, it's pretty damn close. There's some kind of inner reflection and um, little details. But again, there's a trend at SIGGRAPH of the kind of real-time rendering. And we do get the quality. Like if it's localized and you, you know what you're trying to do, like for a PBR shader, um, you can get pretty close to one-to-one. -one. Uh, another one, which was a kind of insanely huge feature that no one knows about, uh, is this thing called the Packages Project. So now we have a new way of bootstrapping your environment into Houdini. So instead of everybody over fighting over the Houdini environment file um, to kind of set up your pipeline, now there's a thing called the packages folder. So essentially, if you have in your regular Houdini uh, uh, folder structure where you have your OTLs and your scripts and everything, if you add a packages folder and you drop a JSON file into it, you can have multiple JSON files that modify your Houdini path. So you can have one for game dev tools, you can have one for your studio tech, you can have one per project, you can have one for your user custom little scripts, you can have one for Redshift, as opposed to the usual problem that everybody's trying to hammer that one single file. Uh, so this came with 17.5, we really didn't make a lot of fuss about it, but from a kind of pipeline handling um, setup, it's, it's, it's really crucial and it's awesome. So you can override the general Houdini path or any system variable there much like you would with Houdini environment. Um, and then I kind of helped out with a lot of the FBX improvements. This has been in the production builds, but I kind of took that over and just helped uh, develop some features. I'll just run through them really fast. Um, skeletal handling, now we can basically round trip characters through Maya and, and any game engines. 
Uh, we can import and export principal shaders, including we can import uh, the Stingray materials from Maya, and we can export out to any game engine, uh, the diffuse and normals. Uh, this is just a, a node limitation. It will still use the FBX shader. Um, and then a bunch of little things. So little things like not changing the timeline when you're importing, uh, exporting custom material properties. I've added Houdini to the FBX file, so we know it came from there. Uh, we cannot export hidden objects, and we can export animation clips. So if you're doing something in AR, this is kind of crucial that you can have multiple animation clips uh, within the same FBX. And then finally, we can actually export arbitrarily named UV channels. So yeah, it doesn't have to be UV 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, with Houdini 16, we've added a texture type when we kind of got rid of the layer workflow, but we never updated the FBX exporter to respect that. So now if your attribute is tagged as a texture attribute, which most of our nodes will do, FBX will pick it up uh, and do it. Um, so as you guys seen, a lot of these tools are just generic improvements. Um, they're not necessarily uh, game specific. So we have a big announcement to uh, make. So the game development tool set is kind of gonna uh, eventually transition over to become side effects labs. And this is uh, a naming change to kind of show just the growth and the kind of um, commitment of side effects to this effort. Um, so why the name change? Realistically, one of the one is a lot of these tools are just generic tools. So having the game dev name there kind of misrepresents them for some people. So some people don't even look at them because it has that name on it, which is a shame, but that's the reality. So having it just be a generic name, it means that uh, it's there. What changes? Realistically, nothing. We're still a game dev team. We still have a game dev background. We're still going to be building uh, game dev tools. But one of the things that we're going to start pushing harder is that convergence. So a lot of the tools that we build are used by film. A lot of the tools that film wants to build, games use. And now that customer loop that I started with now just expanded to the whole industry. So these tools now are going to get the rigor of uh, both industries, which is super exciting. Um, and we can expect this in the future. We haven't really um, decided it, but relatively new future. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll hook it up into the proper packages program, but realistically, uh, just be aware that that's coming, but um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Um, so what's Labs gonna be responsible for? Uh, third party integration, so we do a lot of these. I'll talk into this and I have some uh, cool examples and some awesome announcements. Um, and a lot of the, the regular tools and the agile developments. So um, we're gonna continue the same kind of agile development that we're, we've been doing. So on the third party integrations, we actually have 10 of these at this point. So we've built the ZBrush integration, Reality Capture, Alice Vision, OSM, Sketchfab, Instant Meshes, Facebook 3D, Exporter, um, Marmoset, Mapbox, and the Quixel Bridge. So those are all done by us and maintained by us. So it's, it's another one that's like, not a lot of people might even know that we have a GoZ plugin because they're not kind of within that kind of game dev loop. Uh, the two that we're gonna announce today uh, is we have an integration into Quad Spinner's Gaia uh, which does fabulous terrain erosion. And the big one is uh, Scops integration into Substance. Ah, yes. thank you, thank you. Uh, so we're really excited um, to show both of those. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with Gaia, it is a third party software that is a node based, basically terrain editing tool. Uh, they have some really great nodes and some really great erosion. And it was actually used on Rebirth for a couple of shots and they didn't get the credit they deserve. So I'm calling them out here. Uh, so it, they, they do a great job. So what the integration looks like is actually pretty native. So they work similar to Substance and similar to Houdini where there's a node chain that you can encapsulate those into a, a, a Tor file, which is like a, their own little custom format and you can expose parameters. So it's very much like an SDA or an SBAR. So in Houdini, you have your height field with some noise and you drop a Gaia node. Uh, in this case, it's gonna be a Gaia erosion node. Um, you can run it, and this is running a real time for the first one, which takes, I think this map is the default. So this uh, height field is all default. So it's the default noise and then default um, size. And in around 30 seconds, we get the erosion uh, generated. Uh, for the future ones, I'm going to, uh, let's, oh no, okay. Um, I'll just skip through it. So you have all the parameters that you would have exposed inside of Gaia, and uh, we can just run it, and you get really, really, really nice erosion. Um, 
and it's really fast too. So we did a lot of work to be able to kind of go up and down and dirty uh, nodes. So as you modify your map, everything gets dirty properly. And then when you regenerate it, it will kind of update itself. Um, so we're really happy. The cool thing is that this theoretically will actually run even inside of Unreal. So you could have a landscape. You can run this with through Houdini Engine or Unity and kind of get your eroded uh, maps back up. Um, the way it actually works, and I'll show this another video, is you have that tor file. So we load up that tor file and um, we actually parse all of the parameters dynamically. So whatever parameter you expose in Gaia will come through and be exposed, including um, any kind of file exposure that you did. So in this case, in my example, we just passed in the height, but Paul took over from me while I was uh, coming to SIGGRAPH and he kind of added a bunch of more features. So now you can kind of pass and receive arbitrary map data from Gaia. So in this case, he's passing the height and the mask and he's getting a bunch of kind of erosion data from it. So um, here again, I think it's gonna take a couple of seconds. So I think it takes around 30 seconds. I think in this case, it's gonna be eight. Um, and then we got the erosion back, we got a mask back, and we got a lot of different channels um, that are just native to the regular erosion. So we can use a height field visualize to kind of suss out all of that data that's inside of our volumes and do what you want. So you can send it to scattering, you can do um, anything you want. Um, so it is a command line bridge. Um, we are probably gonna start bundling some default torque graphs, so like erosion and um, a couple of the different filters that are the kind of most famous ones. And then we do support you to do your own custom ones. And then Gaia, um, the, the versions that you will be able to use are with the Pro and the Enterprise, uh, which are both perpetual licenses um, for those prices. So we feel that it's a good um, addition to uh, the tool set. And then the big one is Substance. So we have some friends from uh, Adobe here in the room, so I'm eternally grateful for their help. And um, so the announcement is it's COPS based. So the, we've had a plugin uh, with Substance before. It was in Chops, which was good, but it was strictly material-based. By moving it into Cops, it means that it kind of all of Houdini opens up to you. So you can generate a height map uh, from Substance and then send it to uh, a mesh. And you can send it to vertex colors, you can send it to a height field, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, we do support material, so you can send that straight to uh, uh, a material. And we're actually building this in collaboration with the Adobe team and the Substance team, which is awesome. So if there's a problem on our side, we have the source code for Houdini and we can debug it. And if there's a problem on their side, they have the source code for Substance and they can debug it there. Um, so working together is actually a lot better and we were getting the results a lot faster. So this is what it actually looks like. And this is the simplest example I could come up with, which is the traditional Substance brick uh, that Wes McDermott built together. And here you can see, uh, we have a cop network, we can change parameters, it will recook, it will trigger through all through the network, so I am actually um, using it to displace the geometry, not through a viewport displacement, but actual displacement, and I can apply it to materials. So in my materials, I just have my op references to my cop channels, and then in my geometry, I just have a box that I added some UVs, and I highly subdivided it to be able to displace it, and then I have this attribute from map, which basically can read in vertex colors from a cop network, and then I just do my traditional displacement. Um, and I'm actually doing it as a point wrangle as opposed to the traditional VOPS way. You can tweak your parameters for how much you want to displace. And this is just showing that you can kind of feed substance data anywhere to anywhere. Um, you can send custom data from Houdini into substance and get it back out. Um, so the kind of golden workflow for us is going to be uh, you can model your models, you can bake your map with our super fast baker, you can process that substance all in memory, then you can load it back into your material and then be modeling. So as you're modeling or as you have a procedural model, you can actually run the whole pipeline in memory without ever touching the disk to where you can bake your map, send it to substance, get it back hooked up into your materials and see the result. Um, so having that tight iteration loop is kind of a one-two punch that we feel it's, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful and uh, can't wait to release this and it's coming soon tm but um <laughs> it's coming it's coming it's 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 pretty close so now there's basically three major chunks uh we needed to read in we, we needed to output substance data into houdini we needed to take inputs and we needed to change parameters so all of those things work 
Uh, now it's just a matter of all the nitty gritties and supporting different file formats and different parameters. Uh, but so I'm, I'm pretty comfortable we'll have it hopefully by before the launch of the next Houdini version. Uh, the other one that we've had is uh, we've had this integration with Instant Meshes, which is a super powerful quadri mesher, but it was kind of like a command line integration. And this was our number one requested feature, which is, hey, that's really cool, but can I send curves into Instant Meshes? Because this is what is one of the most powerful features out of Instant Meshes is that you can have your topology being generated, but you can actually comb your topology and kind of guide uh, where you want those quads to go. Uh, so now we have an intern in LA row uh, building this for us, and it's a native C++ integration. So we took the code for instant meshes and then wrapped it with the HTK to actually run it uh, natively in Houdini. And um, you can see we can change parameters, and it's a lot faster because before we'd have to output these objects and then load them back in. Again, the same problem of having files on disks. And now we can uh, basically draw curves with a stroke sop and feed it back in to the, let's see, as a, to the instant mesh sop as a secondary input. Let's see. And the big reveal there. And you can see how. Doo -doo 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 -doo. There it goes. Um, so now there's still some uh, work that we're going to do with cleaning up the singularities, which are the kind of triangle little spots. Um, we've exposed some parameters to be able to relax those and kind of get those out of the way. But uh, Instant Meshes has a couple of other features that you can kind of smooth those out. Uh, but now we're really happy that we're starting to get to where we have a quadri mesh here. We can kind of derive where you want the topology to go um, and work for it. And then the last little thing, uh, again, to show that community feeding back into the tools, uh, 3D straight skeleton has been a problem we've been trying to solve for years. And there's a, a forum post that someone was just like, hey guys, I figured this out. You guys, like, let's see. And then there's like a lot of back and forth that people are like, oh, it doesn't work on my model and it works great over here. Um, so eventually it got to a really good solution. Um, I've asked the author to be able to add it to the game dev tool sets. Um, and this is some of the results that we're getting. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with the 3D straight skeleton, is basically you take a mesh and you start to shrink it into itself to get a skeleton, which is the kind of medial point of your character. Um, and then from here, ideally, we can convert those curves into bones and get something uh, rigged. So in this case, oops, we have my favorite crab. And you can see we're kind of oxalizing it just to not get every single little detail out of it. And then we have the kind of straight skeleton network, and we get a really, really good um, curve network out of it. So the thought is that you can either just take this and do whatever you want with it, or you can use it and start simplifying it or kind of select the points that you want out of this. Uh, this is a generally useful um, problem uh, set to solve, and we're happy that the community kind of contributed to it. Uh, so next, uh, we're almost out of time. So for future work, what are we going to be looking at next? Um, animation and rigging is our big one uh, that we're going to be focusing on heavily. So if you guys have a vested interest in that, uh, do let me know. We have some cool stuff that we're cooking up uh, that we're hoping to be able to show uh, soon. Uh, a lot of viewport interaction. So for some of the animation work, we want to be in the, the viewport. Uh, we're also starting to look at some modeling stuff. Um, so basically leveraging all of the Python states work that has come uh, in the recent years uh, up to Houdini. We are going to play with Houdini at runtime. So this is going to be an experiment that we do for GDC. So if there's some general interest uh, or appetite, uh, let us know. Uh, it's something that we're going to be playing. It is going to be server-based. Uh, so basically have a game uh, talk to a server, do some math in the server, and then get the data back in. Uh, so it's not going to be running on a console or anything. But um, it, it does the trick. And then we're going to go back to terrain and world building. So now we have Gaia. We have a building generator. We still need to kind of hammer on that city generation and scattering. So that's coming. And then virtual production, I put it in before I came, so it's not, I'm like a throwing in a buzzword, but we do have plans of basically working on that conversions and seeing what we can do to help in that space. So if there's an appetite there, also come up uh, and let me know. And thanks, that's all I got. <laughs> so I'll take any questions. I think we have the cube to throw around. I don't know how I'm on time. If there's someone after me, if I'm the last one. I think I'm the last one, so it doesn't matter. You can stay as long as you guys want. Questions up here in the front?
Is this on? There you go. Is yeah. your back and forth with Substance similar to how you described it with Gaia, where they can sort of communicate with each other, like you'll build a network in Substance, expose some parameters, use yeah. those parameters in Tudini, go back kind of a round trip between those two things? Yeah, so the for the, the Substance plugin is even more tightly than with Gaia. So Gaia is just a command line. Um, integration with Substance, it's actually in memory to where we're passing. It's like we're, it's a proper compiled. The workflow is you make a Substance archive, so a spar, and then you expose whatever parameter you want there, and then you can load that in COPS, and all the parameters got dynamically generated. And you can, uh, the way we're doing it, your multiple inputs are matched by name um, through image planes. So like COPS have the notion of you can have a, your curvature, your normal, your world normal, and all of that data kind of stacked together as image planes inside a single cop. You pass that single cop into Substance, it will name match your planes to the inputs that it's expecting, and then it will output a cop that has all of the outputs that it has. And then you just have to do some work to kind of slice it back out and then feed the height to wherever you want to feed it and uh, all of the different components to what you want to do with them. Hey. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy that's always putting like the hooray uh, response on every time that there's like a brand new update because I awesome. think it's awesome. Um, I was wondering on your cable generator, uh, one of the things that I think um, would be useful is some way to kind of like get the cables to like kind of uh, dangle or like kind of move. And I know I can kind of do this like, you know, by integrating them you know, into, um, you know, you know, with the physical uh, properties, but I think it, it doesn't really need to be that complicated. It could be like a lot simpler just to kind of give some movements, you know, like you have like yeah. some kind of like, you know, electrical lines or something in the distance. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that's something that you guys might think about implementing. It is point. now. That's, okay. the, that's the system at work. Rock on. <laughs> Thank you yeah, so much. No, it should be. And then the question is, do you do that? Well, you probably want to do it within the SOP itself, because you could do it before, like in the curve that's generating it and kind of moving it, but that might cause some weirdness of it generating something different per frame. So yeah. we can either add some motion, some, the, yeah. The, that sure. would rock, thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else? So, um, really, really excited about the substance integration. That's super cool. Um, so could I do something that sort of, you know, going back and forth where, uh, you know, I generate, I don't know, maybe a rock, uh, I, I generate some VDB noise, yada, yada, yada. Then I generate a material on top of that. Then I displace with that material. Then I use that, send that back into substance, do some other stuff, like just really go back and forth a couple yeah. of times. Yeah, absolutely. So, as long as it's procedural to where it's like the steps are, you generated your noise, you sent it to Substance, you brought it back in, and then you did something else with that, and then you sent it back to Substance. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Awesome. It's just, there's baking steps in there. Uh, the Maps Baker has an auto baker. Mm -hmm. So you can just say, as whenever it cooks, don't even press the button. Just if something updates, bake it automatically. Sweet. Um, it's going to take nine seconds to cook, but uh, yeah, totally. If okay. you're going to do the idea is, I can then now make a rock generator library that I can let it rip overnight with PDG and I will have textures that match everything and I have the whole process kind of fully there. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, that was cute. Hi, uh, with the Sketchfab exporter, is yeah. it possible to re-upload meshes or do you have to export out like an fbx and go through the website no it uploads it straight from sketchfab are you saying like if you upload it at once if you want to do you it changed again changed it yeah and you want to re probably not but we could be able to we should be able to do that yeah just yeah because i think if we just say if it's the same name or the same id or you say like just add a checkbox to say change it yeah that's a good idea that'd be great yeah thanks thanks big behind you yes. <laughs> I'm kind of a new Houdini user, so maybe you already have this, but is there a way to like render out fire and smoke and explosions and flip books really yes. quickly, like with emissive and depth and all those yeah. kind of passes? Yeah, so we have a tool called Texture Sheets. Okay. And that's what it does. It basically it takes a camera and then it spits out all of the channels that you want and lets you repack them however you want to. Yeah, check it out. Cool. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, we got one more back here. Yeah. 
That's good. And like all of this stuff, it's it's relatively short. So if there's more, let me know. Like if because these are kind of gates, like basically like production gates. That's like even custom attributes on materials. Some people are like, if I don't have that, I can't switch my team over because we store data there, and I can't. Like it's it's who needs that to me on that point. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of effort on our side to make that work for you guys. And so just be vocal about it. .ntl? Yeah. I'll do that one too. We vote, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We just did, someone was trying to do that and they made a reader for, that just read the object, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that's a good one. We'll take a look at it. Anybody else? All right. Thanks for coming. Hope you have a good cigarette.